five, four, three, two, one. Hello and welcome to Life in the Foam, the podcast about the 21st century media, where you may be connected to everyone else, but maybe you're programming your own environment all off on your own. It's a wild new world out there, and today to talk about it, I was so happy to have a wonderful discussion with Howard Rheingold. Now, Howard Rheingold is one of the most important writers and uh, historians in the un- unfolding story of computers in the 20th and 21st century. Uh, his books have been immensely helpful to me on my various projects, my, my video series Silicon and Charybdis, uh, the story of Alan Kay and Doug Engelbart is all um, uh, told in, in his 1985 book Tools for Thought. His book Virtual Reality explores the meaning of disembodied vicarious existence in cyberspace. Uh, in the early 90s, long before the commercially available virtual reality technology of today. He also wrote um, uh, The Virtual Community, an essential book about what it means to exist in online communities. Uh, again, in the early 90s, uh, exploring his, uh, his uh, life in the well, the uh, Whole Earth catalog. He was actually ed- ed- editor of the Whole Earth catalog in the 90s. Um, he also got his start in the computer field being the uh, writer, the person who uh, helped write up and develop documents uh, for the Xerox PARC team in Xerox when they were developing the Alto and the graphic user interface and Ethernet and object-oriented programming. Um, so he's been in the center of, of the construction of our digital world for for decades. I'm very happy to have him. You can follow all of his stuff on uh, his Patreon, patreon.com slash Howard Rheingold, one word, R-H-E-I-N-G-O-L-D. Uh, again, as is my curse, I uh, lost the audio for the very first minute of our discussion. So one more time, I have to drop us right into almost the very beginning of uh, of my interview. Uh, it started when I asked him about whether corporations like Facebook or Google would be able to maintain centralized control in the same way uh, that uh, early uh, 20th century centralized media did, or whether the internet was just going to continue to like become more and more of the distributed Wild West like it was when I was a kid in the 90s. He, uh, his answer, which uh, we'll hear most of shortly, began with uh, pointing out that our corporations primarily just want to maximize profit and will do anything to uh, to earn the profit of their shareholders. So uh, that's going to be the driving force of all of their decisions and actions. And uh, from that point on, please enjoy uh, this awesome discussion with Howard Rheingold with me, Clinton Ignatov, on Life in the Foam. They buy information about you so that each of those two billion individuals on Facebook um, have a, a, a dossier of their characteristics and that enables facebook to sell advertising that will micro target individuals if you if you want to have a a a white rural female who votes democratic and as a vegetarian you can do that that is a spectacular way for Facebook to make money. It's also a great way for state actors like like the Russians and the and the Iranians and um, individuals and 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 groups like hate groups to micro target. Well, what they're selling are not products, but but persuading you of an idea. Um, so they can persuade you that. Uh, that there are political situations that uh, that threaten them that don't really exist. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, um, that's a big issue. Uh, back in um, 2012, in in my book Net Smart, I I wrote about five essential social media literacies. Um, the first one being attention. Um, because that's the, the foundation of our thinking and our communication, and it's and it's what uh, our our fascination with the, the online world and with our our, our smartphones um, really hooks into. The, the, and the good news about that is that it's it's not totally out of our control. That we we simply are given no training in in how to control our attention, and so you know it it is possible. Uh, to do that. Uh, for example, I've decided I don't want to look at my phone 
uh, an hour before bedtime or an hour after getting up in the morning, just to exert a little bit of control over um, who is is uh, using my uh, attention. The second of my five literacies was uh, craft detection, uh, a term I took from Ernest Hemingway. He said that every good journalist requires a, an, an internal craft detector. And I, I wrote about all kinds of ways that we could teach our, our children and our students um, how to think critically about what's on the internet. And, and there are a lot of resources for that. I mean, it's, it's easy enough to just uh, Google the name of the author of something to see what uh, others may say about them. And there are a number of other techniques. I'm concerned that since then, the, the arms race between um, the disinfotainment complex and individual critical thinking is really tilted in in favor of the disinfotainment complex the 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 knowledge of an engineering of how to attract and maintain our attention and our engagement has become so much more sophisticated than than what we're learning and what we're teaching about how to um, how to think critically about life online so uh, I'm, uh, I don't really know about that. And I want to circle back to the smart mobs because in 2000, you did not see people, you didn't see people in the U.S. looking at their, their, their telephones. Um, you did in other parts of the world, but uh, I was in Japan, I was in Finland around that time, and I noticed that people were walking down the street looking at their phones, so I started looking into what that might mean, and I noticed what, uh, what, what futurists called signals. Well, one of those signals was that the uh, president of the Philippines was, was deposed because people organized mass uh, demonstrations using text messaging. And that, in fact, there, was a, uh, there were demonstrations in Seattle in the U.S. against the meeting of the World Trade Organization in which the, the demonstrators were, were using their phones and the Internet to coordinate. So I, you know, as a uh, a writer and uh, um, a a reporter on thing uh, things technological, I, I went to sociologists and asked what they thought might be happening, and and they said it looks like having people who have phones that are connected to the internet and that also have location capabilities that know where they are enable groups of people to coordinate um, what sociologists call collective action in, in new ways. And, and collective action can be good uh, or it can be bad, uh, depending on the intentions of the people who are doing that. So that, you know, I, I wrote about that. The book was published in 2002. So that was quite a while ago. We're now living in that that world and, and we're, we're seeing, the, you know, both both sides of it that that we are manipulated through our attention and our engagement by services that, that, that provide useful things like, like search and like, like smartphone apps. Uh -huh. um, but also we are using those to act in new ways. You know, there was the, the Egyptian uh, revolution that, was, that started on Facebook um, and, you know, many, many other activities in the world. And, you know, I wrote about power and counterpower. In those days, um, citizens were discovering this power that the internet and smartphones were, were giving them, and, and governments were largely ignorant of that. That has long since ceased to be the case. Governments and, and other uh, actors like, like corporations uh, have a very sophisticated knowledge, you know, much more so than most of the people online. Absolutely. Uh, I'm really glad uh, you mentioned um, the, f the f f fiduciary incentives of, of these corporations uh, to make money and, and, to, um, and, uh, and their gamification, their, the way that they make um, machines addictive, um, these sort of prop properties. Um, I've, do you think it's, it's, it's fair to say that there's a big problem in, in marketers and uh, reinventing language 
over and over and over again when it comes to how computers exist or are or um, are used to constantly try to make us think we're buying a brand new thing when it's in fact a very thin veneer slapped over the same thing which has been around for decades and decades and decades. We have this habit of looking at, say, computers from the 80s or 90s as ancient or stone age when in fact something that does anything a million times a second seems to me to be a, a rather modern miracle regardless of, of how you might want to paint the image of ear early obsolescence to get the brand new thing. There's very little things I do in my computer today that as a kid my, you know, Pentium computer couldn't have done, right? Um, I'm a Linux user, I'm a hobbyist, so I, I'd rather proactively control the machine than, than install the apps from the top 10 app list and go with the flow of what the current trendy n new thing is as it reinvents the wheel. Um, you say you, or you did rather invent social media in the mid 90s with your social web 10 years too too early for for instance and this is back when online communication was called CMC or computer mediated communication um, it seems to me do you, do you is there do you as a writer need to constantly rewrite the same things you're saying um, in new terms in the new vogue terms of the uh, of the second in order to communicate to people what's going on or or would it be better if everyone just learned the history the ancient stone age history of a whole whopping 20 years ago to realize how very little has changed except say um, you know the qualitative changes in our society have come about through purely quantitative changes in 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 the accessibility of these machines but the machines themselves do everything that they did 20 30 years ago right well, I, I'll, I'll have to disagree with you a little bit in the huh. sense that, uh, well, if you go back a little bit further than, than 30 years, the uh, all of the computing power in, in the Apollo uh, spacecraft that, that went to the moon and back, there's probably more computing power in one app on, on your smartphone today. So, so that's significant. In, in regard to the history, well, you know, I taught college students for 10 years and and, um, and became really aware of how little history is really uh, conveyed in our education system. I, I originally wrote Tools for Thought in 1984, it was published in, in 1985, because so much attention was being paid to Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, who were very important at that time. But they were building on the work that had been done at Xerox Park and had been done by Doug Engelbart and before uh, Engelbart, even uh, Alan Turing, John von Neumann, um, Lady Lovelace, George Boole. There was, you know, uh, the thing about science, and and this is particularly true about computer science, is that people build on a body of, of knowledge that, that was created by by others so that that it becomes progressively more powerful. Uh, very few people knew anything about that, which is why I wrote Tools for Thought, and, and I, I don't think that very many people know much about that uh, these days either. Our educational system, um, either talking about you know parents trying to teach their kids the, the facts of life in the 21st century, or our, our schools, our, our, our public schools, or even our very expensive uh, private universities are way behind the, the technology in, in terms of how the technology can manipulate, manipulate us, how the technology can empower us. Uh, we're really not taught that. Uh, if I could just wave a magic wand, I would have uh, significant resources given to educating parents so that they could <clears throat> help their kids understand. Um, you know, in that regard, for example, um, every time a parent looks at their phone while their, their children are trying to get their attention, they're really damaging that relationship and they're also training their kids to, to think that their attention to their devices may be more important than attention to their their loved ones you know and, and that's a, a a fairly simple thing to to teach and, and i also think um, although as i said 
in the in the arms race, the the forces of disinformation are have disproportionately powerful. We can at least teach some elementary critical thinking so that the 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 worst of the of the disinformation out there could that we can immunize them to, to some degree about that. So I, I you know I I look at what can we do about this. Um, well, uh, I don't have the answer to what, what do you do about capitalism. Um, there, there is a, a pretty lively conversation these days about attention engineering and about the you know doing something about the, the way companies uh, manipulate us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, YouTube, uh, for example, will um, show you in increasingly. Uh, radical videos you can start out uh, looking at a, a gaming video and end up being recruited to, to isis or re recruited to um uh, uh being a nazi uh this isn't because uh, google or youtube want you to to do that it's because their algorithm is is optimized for uh engagement uh -huh. um being able to to deal with these things is not impossible, but I think if you don't understand them, it's very, very difficult. So, uh, you know, again, teaching history, but also teaching some understanding of what agency people have, what people can do about it, I think is um, one of the few things um, we as individuals can, can do about the negative effects of, of technology. And, and of course, all of the effects of, of information technology are not negative uh, we use these things because they enable us to live our lives in better ways uh, people don't use maps anymore <laughs> if you have uh, a rare disease and only one in a million people have it there are two thousand others uh, on the internet and there are support mm -hmm. groups for people like that so you know the good stuff and the bad stuff happens uh simultaneously uh, my friend uh, Mark Smith, who's a, a sociologist of, of technology, puts it this way. He says, you know, the technology is a rising tide that lifts all boats. And, and, and some of those boats are hospital ships, and, and, and some of them are, are, are filled with bloodthirsty pirates and, and child pornographers and, and, and Nazis. And so we have to understand that a tool that amplifies human capabilities will amplify the capabilities of, of people who, who don't have benevolent ends in mind. Certainly. Uh, well put. And I love that metaphor. Um, uh, it's interesting because I'm coming at this from the inside out of having been very involved in online computer, um, co like being on the internet uh, all the time since the, since the dial up as a kid I'd get up at you know like uh, three in the morning to, to use the phone line without making sure no one could uh, I wouldn't was I wasn't cutting off anyone else's access to the telephone and get a few hours in it every day that's that sort of thing but but uh, all of the obvious lessons that we learned there which were you know um, stay anonymous it's much safer it's absolutely a terrible idea to, to be public online it's a terrible idea to, to you know unless you want all the problems that you know a celebrity has of stalkers and muckrakers and you know, right like to to be a public fig figure is basically you know to take on a ridiculous responsibility which is what the internet afforded and then so sh shortly thereafter social media comes along and just throws everybody nakedly into the public spotlight uh you know to have a, all of their um their ideas and thoughts and half thought out nitwit dr drunken posts at two in the morning held against them for the rest of their life as political fodder, right? Like we, we've sort of stumbled into this strange situation. It's sort of like a, a worldwide Mexican standoff of uh, of, uh, of 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 people who are public and vulnerable, and then the dark web of people, say, who are more cautious, who are well. They have the upper hand, but they're anonymous cowards in the slash dot term. They're, uh, they're, 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 you know, you know, like, are we vilifying people? Well, here, here's a question. Um, is anonymity as a, you know, dark nebulous sort of thing that, that, that gets demonized, do you think that contributes neg negatively to, uh, 
t to uh, to the idea of um, social responsibility online? Um, is it more socially responsible for everyone to just join in and throw all their personal life out there, or do we need um, people who who uh, maintain a private identity anymore online? Well, there there are a few things, uh, um, a few questions in there. Uh, one is, uh, you may think you're anonymous, but the companies that are tracking you uh, know you're not uh, mm. anonymous. So there's the, the uh, just from the, the, the track, tracking pixels and, and cookies that companies uh, put onto your browser, they know where you're going and, and what you're looking at online. So again, increasingly, it's very difficult to be anonymous in that sense, in the social sense of of, of slash that, of, of putting your name on your statements. You know, that's, again, that's a rising tide uh, uh, lifts all boats issue. Um, if you are a domestic uh, abuse victim or you are a whistleblower um, uh, or you're a political dissident, anonymity is a, a, a shield in from the public. Um, on the other hand, uh, there, there are Twitter mobs and all kinds of other ways that, that, that people can make your life um, hellish uh, because you, you've put your identity online. I, in, in terms of social interaction, I think that any um, place in which people are, are required to use their real names does have a, 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 a a modicum of civility that, that places, you know, like 4chan or, or 8chan um, certainly don't have. So again, I think we need a more sophisticated, nuanced understanding of, of these issues. It's not always black and white. You got to kind of sort out things in in the in the the, the gray area. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it was like this uh, on, say, The Well, but uh, the online communities the, uh, that I was a part of, uh, the uh, they were bottom-up, um, and, and they sort of organically grew systems of civility or, or, or uh, their own rules, and, and, you know, you the moderators were part of the community, and everyone sort of, each community sort of had its way to hash out a uh, the right balance of justice for the tone and the character of that site. Whereas a company like Twitter just goes and hires some third-party corporation who who pays a bunch of lackeys to sit there and look at all the terrible pictures that they have to censor without any sort of, right, it's a top-down, th 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 the scalability of a community that size, an online community, can't have the sort of organic character flavor of a, of a community where, where people are as individuals actually growing their own culture, where their own emoticons even. Now we've got the standardized palette of 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 um, emoji, so-called, as opposed to you know how uh, earlier online communities you you could uh, you know customize your iconic your uh, icon iconographic language. Is there any way we well, can? Re the, hmm? the scale of Facebook is a is, is a, a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's an enormous amount of uh, child pornography. There are horrible videos of people being beheaded. Oh, yeah. um, there's an enormous amount of abuse and they hire people to try to keep up with it, but they probably have, have hired less than 10% of the number of people they need to keep up with it. The, the other issue is that the people who spend all day looking at this horrible material are having some serious psychological issues. Uh, if you've got two billion people online, uh, you, you really can't police it out algorithmically. You need to have humans checking it out, and and, and they really can't. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, I think uh, part of the problem is is scale, it's, uh, particularly w with a company that's, that's got that profit uh, imperative. They, they're, uh, they do have... Um, you know some reason to to want to make their their material uh, less offensive but uh not at the cost of their 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 profits so i, I don't really see much hope for facebook in that sense I, I think youtube could change its algorithm and uh make it uh 
less possible for people to start out looking at games and end up being Nazis, it would require them to forego some of their profits. So although it's mm -hmm. possible, it's, it's not likely. Um, and you're right, the well, like many other you know, smaller communities online, um, have the capacity to be self-policing, to use norms and, and, and rules and, and have a, a, a pretty healthy place. And, and I think, again, I talked about uh, um, support groups for, for people with, with diseases. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of, like raisins in, in a, 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 a rising dough, uh, there are little communities all over the, the web in, in, in which there, there is some, some real sense of community and conviviality but when you scale it up to billions of people um it's very difficult to do that and you know i'll have to say that uh, I, I quit facebook uh, gee over a year ago um but there are facebook groups that are 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 you know perfectly um uh, wonderful oh yeah uh, and, and healthy for people and there are facebook groups that are just horrible horrible uh places um you know, yeah. uh, again, uh, you know, there's there's a problem with the, the way they organize their 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 groups, just in terms of the user interface. Uh -huh. um, it you know it, it privileges the last thing that was said, and right. so um, oh, it makes it difficult for a group of any size to have any kind of uh, conversation that extends for any period of time. I I uh, need to stay on Facebook for uh, my access to the greater. Um... McLuhan com community because that's where it all plays out. So, if we want to like, uh, if you want to look at Facebook and Twitter as walled gardens um, provided by corporations, where smaller communities can, within those walled gardens, create their own little sub subcultures. That's all within something that's that's you know, policeable by by these corporations. But the things you're talking about, like say like um, uh, the awful like child porn or or, or uh, be beheading videos and stuff, those have been a staple of the greater Wild West internet. Um, you remember Rotten.com? I think it was that, or uh, Ogrish rather, that turned into um, LiveLeak. LiveLeak.com is like the YouTube of of uh, crazy videos that just happen to be recorded security cameras catching robberies or, or uh, war footage just all the ridiculous um, you know 18 plus do not watch this not safe for sanity stuff right I mean this is uh, I think it was Camille Paglia who said that we need to really understand you know the, the impulses of the Marquis de Sade as much as we need to understand Rousseau if if you want to have a full appreciative spectrum of of the, of the human scale and I mean the internet is a horrible traumatizing uh, crash course in in exposure to the fullness of 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 the human uh, situation and its extremes if you stray out of the safe little comfortable lanes that are easily profitable for corporations uh, uh, the little infotainment sectors so it's just I I don't know I um, it's, it's something we you need to you know expose children to gradually but at the same time it seems really fraught to try and create uh, 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 the whole internet into the sort of healthy communities that we ideally want to spend most of our time in you know, again, I think it comes down to we, we need a, a, a massive um, society-wide educational effort. And, you know, I think the, the good news about that is that education is a, a lot less expensive than, than, than trying to, to change the, uh, the nature of the corporation or, or, or change technology. Um, education is about changing uh, what people know. You can change the uh, consumer. Mate. Yes. Mm. Um, so again, I think in terms of attention engineering, teaching people to begin to control their attention will do some good. Uh, it's not going to solve the problem entirely, but it's going to uh, uh, ameliorate it. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I think teaching people to, have, to, to know how to think critically and use easily available tools to to try to, to determine the veracity of information online mm -hmm. is a, a useful thing to do, and we, and we should do it in elementary school. Kids are, are, 
are searching. Uh, you know, at what age did you start using search? I mean, it's some, it, it, it's something that. I was using that... Alta Vista when that way when I was um, ten. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, you know, um, when my daughter first started using search engines uh, to do her homework, I, I I sat down with her on the computer and I said. Uh, you know, you can get a book out of the library, and and you can pretty much know that there was a an editor and a publisher and a and a librarian who were all gatekeepers to make sure that 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 you could trust that information. The text had some some authority to it. Now you can ask any question at any time and anywhere and get a million answers or ten million answers, and it's up to you to determine which of those answers are are good information and which are misinformation or or disinformation, it's, I think it's miraculous. Uh, I must uh, uh, use search, you know, a hundred times a day. Um, it's extended the ability of, uh, to, to know and to think and to, and to communicate. Um, but I'm the one who needs to determine whether what I find is, is going to be useful or if you're talking about medical information or political information, it could be dangerous to your health or or dangerous to your your literacy. So you know, again, um, the, the the technology and the and the the social aspects of the technology have moved so fast, and our institutions for educating people move so slowly. Um, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I could I could see where maybe there would be a um, a benevolent uh, government that said we need to spend taxpayer resources, you know, just as we do on public education, to educate people before they are totally immersed uh, in the in the online world and the tools that are available there. Uh, I've got just a few minutes. All right. Here, um, so. so I mean, I I don't want to make the the. The, the internet or technology sound um, sound awful. It enables all sorts of wonderful um, opportunities um, for independent content creators to uh, to create great stuff. I mean, you actually um, have a wonderful Patreon account um, where you're constantly posting your new stuff. Uh, Patreon.com slash Howard Rheingold, for instance. So I've been very pleased to be following lots of your writings as you've been posting them there. Uh, uh, it's fantastic that, that uh, people can support creators that they love in that regard. And uh, yeah, again, these take all happen within something like a sanctuary of civility all governed over by benevolent or benevolent seeming corporations trying to keep things safe for, um, for civil society and civil political discussion. But there's always the possibility of, you know, ideology or um, or uh, totalitarianism whenever you you know who watches the watchers sort of thing it seems the people watching the watchers tend to end up getting um, uh, say uh, politically maligned as uh, for the experience of how rhetoric um, can easily create a world so a worldview in the people who inhabit some online com 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 community right if the people of uh, oh. I, I like uh, Patreon because it, it doesn't uh, depend on gathering information about me and selling that information to advertisers as its oh. business model. And, I, and it, the business model is that people who want to support creators can, can give us a dollar or, or five dollars or ten dollars a month and get access to uh, material. and. Um, that, that we produce and uh, you know on Facebook people have access to material that I produce but um, I don't get any money out of it and and both of the, the people who, who read the material and me are, are being surveilled so that they can sell our information to, to others so I don't know that the, the the patreon model of people paying each other for useful uh, knowledge and information and, and artistic creations is is going to scale to the entire internet. But I like to participate in it because I I think when I'm doing it that I'm I am um, helping create a culture in which creators are are supported by others 
Mm -hmm. um, rather than participating in a culture in which only the, the stockholders of the corporation are going to to profit from from my work. So, you know, that's, again, that's a little, um, well, it's not terribly little. I think they've paid out a couple of hundred million dollars to, to creators. Um, you know, Facebook and Google probably make that kind of money in a, a, a couple of days. But, mm -hmm. you know, again, we need to explore all of the alternatives that are available to us. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. I mean, I've got a million more questions, but unfortunately, we don't have a million more hours to work through them all. So I'd love to have you back on at some point in, in the future. Uh, thank you very much. I've been having this discussion with uh, Howard Reingold, prolific... Uh, writer of the book of computers as as they came uh, the many books of computers as uh, they came upon our world and uh, I feel like if education is the key to um, to uh, regrounding us in in reality then uh, I can't think of a more concentrated source of important pertinent information than uh, your uh, life work thus far so I'd like to thank you for that thank you so much for the opportunity to all talk right about it. Uh, thanks a lot, and thanks to our listeners at home. This is uh, ConcernedNetizen.com to stay on top of my stuff, and Patreon.com slash Howard Reingold to follow Howard Reingold's um, uh, continued expression and existence online in our one world virtual community. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Yes.